Okay, we're going to wrap up chapter three with section 3.5, control of cell division. So let me share my screen with you. We'll take a look at the first slide in this last section. And let's watch uh, an animation that does a good job sort of walking us through this very important process that takes place within our cells. The process of cell growth and division in eukaryotes is called the cell cycle. This cycle is divided into phases based on what is happening in the cell at a given time. A cell grows during the G1 phase. During this phase, there is a chemical checkpoint that controls whether the cell will divide, delay division, or enter a resting stage. When conditions in the cell are right, the G1 checkpoint will be passed and the cell will enter the synthesis, S phase. During the S phase, DNA replication occurs so that future cells will each have a complete set of the genetic instructions in the DNA. After DNA replication is complete, cells enter the G2 phase where they continue to grow and prepare for cell division. At a checkpoint in this phase, the success of DNA replication is assessed if all is well, the cell enters the mitosis, M phase. During the M phase, a complex series of events moves the DNA so that a complete set of genetic instructions will be sent to each daughter cell. The process of mitosis is assessed at a checkpoint during the M phase. Once this checkpoint is passed, the cell will complete mitosis as well as begin the cytokinesis, C phase. Part or all of the C phase actually overlaps with the later parts of mitosis, so it is not a distinctly separate phase. During the C phase, the cytoplasm of the cell is divided and two daughter cells are created from the original cell. When this process is finished, the daughter cells enter the G1 phase and the cycle is complete. So this should look very familiar to you. We just got done talking about that in the previous lecture. What we're introducing here is the concept that as a cell progresses through the cell cycle, that there are at least three key times when the process is assessed and the cell is even given, either given a green light at that particular checkpoint to proceed onward or a red light, which would stop the cell in that particular stage of the cell cycle. So what governs whether cells get green lights or red lights at different stages of the cell cycle? Well, we alluded to a little bit of this not too long ago. Remember we said that when we got a cut, that that cut repaired itself within a few days. In other words, that that injury is really what stimulated the cells to divide, is what kind of overrode those red lights and maybe turned them into green lights and the cells divided to, to repair that little gap that was formed during that paper cut. Um, there are other times in one's life or in one's development that the frequency of cell division may be turned on, turned off, or certainly very, very regulated. There are some cells in our body, like our skin cells, in our bone, we have cells that are constantly producing more blood cells. These are examples of cells that are constantly being produced as a result of cell division. So there's green lights at all of those checkpoints all the time that result in the formation of skin cells because we slough those off every day and they have to be replaced. Um, our red blood cells, for example, have a finite lifespan. They live on, on average about three months then they're recycled by the body and new red blood cells need to be formed in the red bone marrow. However, there are other cell types that may only be stimulated to divide during certain times in our lives. And the best example I can give you is to think about what happens during embryonic and fetal development. 
we know that nerve cells like, like these called neurons um, are produced, produced during embryonic and fetal stages of one's life. But there comes a point in time where we no longer, your body no longer produces new neurons. They divide, and when a certain number is reached, they stop dividing. And that's the issue we have, of course, with trying to repair severed uh, spinal cords and other uh, nervous system injuries, right? Um, because it's, it's not like we can just automatically cause those cells to fill the gap that was formed when that particular nerve was cut or that spinal cord was severed although we are working on trying to have that happen. But at present, there's nothing that we can do uh, shy of some laboratory research work um, to cause neurons to replicate themselves. They just don't generally want to do that after a certain time in one's development. Another interesting mechanism that controls cell division has to do with the length of the chromosomes, of all things. Remember us talking about the chromosomes in the preceding lecture. Well, if you look at a chromosome, the tips of those are, have a special name. They're called telomeres. The telomeric ends of chromosomes are the, are the tips of the chromosomes. And they've discovered that as a cell line goes to, to undergo this process of cell, of cell division, that the chromosomes get progressively shorter as time goes on. And that may have some to role. The may, that may have some role to play in um, maybe stopping that process of cell division in that particular cell line. We have seen, as a result of psych psychological uh, research, that stress can cause premature shortening of chromosomes and thus impact cell division. So here's a tie between one's psychological state and one's cellular uh, health. Very interesting. We also know that there are a variety of chemicals in the body called kinases and cyclins that can also play big roles in, um, at those checkpoints to either give the green light for the cell to proceed onward or to give the cell a red light and stop that particular cell from dividing beyond that checkpoint. Hormones and other chemicals called growth factors can also stimulate cells to divide. And one of the best examples I can give you, as you'll talk more about in ANP2 in the endocrine chapter, is growth hormone or GH. You all know that when you were 10, 11, 12, 13, you probably went through a growth spurt. That's, that's the, the phrase we use, right? At puberty, there tends to be a much, uh, uh, much more cell division resulting in a person's stature getting taller. So there's actually some going, something going on in the bones, really, which we'll talk about in another chapter. But that process of growing taller, that growth spurt, uh, or growth in general, as, as you go from infant to adulthood, that is determined by the amount of growth hormone produced by the pituitary gland. And that, in turn, impacts um, bones and how bones lay down their, their osseous tissue. If we look at what occurs during the menstrual cycle in a female, that process of the sloughing off of the endometrium during the first few days of the cycle, um, that process of endometrial sloughing off and then the subsequent rebuilding of that endometrial lining in preparation for possible uh, pregnancy is under the guidance or auspices of this hormone called progesterone. And you'll be talking more about estrogen and progesterone and other hormones when you get into the um, developments chapter again in ANP2. But this is a hormone that has a monthly cycle um, with the production of progesterone increasing in time, which results in adding more cells to the endometrium of the uterus. Again, that is designed to provide the perfect conditions for implantation of the fertilized egg and subsequent pregnancy. And another interesting control mechanism or phenomenon um, 
that regulate cell division is referred to as contact inhibition. We can demonstrate this quite nicely in the laboratory. If we take some cells, maybe they're skin cells, and we grow them in a petri plate, we provide them with the perfect growing conditions, we provide them with nutrients, the correct temperature and so forth, they will grow here as we can see on the diagram, uh, forming a single layer at the bottom of the petri plate. If we remove some of those cells and form a gap, those cells that are on the edge of that gap will be stimulated to undergo cell division and basically lay down cells to replace those that were removed. Once we reestablish that single layer, then there's no further cell division. So the contact that a cell has with another cell inhibits its ability to contract, to uh, replicate or divide. Now, when you talk about cancer, however, cancer does not obey contact inhibition. These cells continue to divide again and again and again until pretty soon you form what you and I would refer to as a tumor. So rather than getting a red light to stop dividing, like these cells would, would get, right? Once that gap is filled, there's no longer any cell division. So they're told, stop dividing. Cancer cells get green lights at all those checkpoints all the time. So the result is constant cell division, one cell piling up on top of the other, and we form, again, a tumor. When we talk about tumors, we often talk about benign or malignant tumors malignant and cancerous are sort of the same thing. So what is the difference between a benign tumor and a cancerous or malignant tumor? Well, there are a number of different differences between the two, but the easiest way to kind of think of it is that a benign tumor tends to be a localized growth that can be often surgically removed and that will not come back. A cancerous or malignant tumor, however, has the ability to spread or metastasize. Here we have an interesting electron micrograph. This was taken um, either in the fallopian tubes or the upper respiratory tract, I'm not sure which. But what I want to really point out here is the very obvious physical difference between these normal ciliated cells, these little bitty hair-like structures on the surface are cilia, and then look at these cancerous cells. They do not have cilia. Their shape is very, 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 very different. It's very easy to tell under the microscope that these are not normal cells. Here's another interesting electron, a micrograph, a set of them showing um, a ovarian cancer, a cluster of cancer cells here in the ovary, forming this small tumor. Here's a breast cancer cell, artificially colored. It actually looks kind of pretty in a very weird kind of way. But these are helping the cell anchor themselves to the surrounding tissue. Normally, you wouldn't have that in healthy breast tissue. Some characteristics of cancer are listed here in this table. We talked about how there's no contact inhibition, there's no red lights at the checkpoints, there's constant green lights, so the cells continue to divide and divide and divide and divide. The fact that one cancer cell can divide to form more cancer cells, this is not an uncommon uh, expectation, right, that a cancer cell, when it divides, can lead to more cancer cells forming. That's really what a tumor is, right? Um, this de-differentiation uh, property means that the cancer cell doesn't do what the normal healthy cell does, and that sort of makes sense. But we often talk about normal healthy cells having a particular function or role to play. They are differentiated to the point where they they, they perform as they should uh, in whatever capacity that cell is. Cancer cells do not 
differentiate in the sense of having a good function. They are there to spread and divide and divide and divide. So they are de-differentiated. They do not obey contact inhibition as we talked about. They also have the insidious ability to produce their own blood vessels in a process called angiogenesis. I'll show you a picture of that in just a moment. Why would a cancer cell or a tumor find this to be helpful, the formation of blood vessels? Well, where do cells get their nutrients? Any cell, cancer cell or non-cancer cell. The nutrients come from the blood supply, right? The blood carries those nutrients that have been absorbed by our digestive system. And those nutrients help power the cell, help provide the cell with ATP, right, energy. So this is a way of a tumor providing itself with a constant, ever-growing blood supply because it needs those nutrients as it divides to form more and more and more cancer cells. Many cancers are invasive. It depends upon what type of cancer it is as to its invasiveness, but certainly that term describes uh, a property of cancer cells. And as we said a moment ago, these malignant tumors often have the ability to metastasize or spread. And how do you think cancer spreads in the body? Well, there are two major highway systems, if you will, that a cancer can spread. One is the cardiovascular system via the blood vessels, and the other is the lymphatic system via lymph vessels. Those are the two major highway systems, the blood and the lymphatic vessels that allow cancer cells to break off of tumors, get carried in the, in the lymphatic system or carried in the bloodstream, and eventually set up shop in another organ or another tissue. Good case in point would be breast cancer. When breast cancer metastasizes, the two primary metastatic sites for breast cancer is bone and brain. Those are the two common sites for breast cancer to set up shop, if you will, once it spreads beyond the breast. Different cancers have different metastatic sites. So let's take a look at what happens in healthy, differentiated, specialized cells. Well, that cell is performing what it's supposed to do, contracting if it's a muscle cell, transmitting impulses if it's a neuron, whatever the case may be. In healthy cells, we have a couple different types of genes that we're gonna talk about here, shown there in red, oncogenes and tumor suppressor genes. Onco refers to cancer, an oncologist is a cancer physician. When these oncogenes are expressed, that leads to a bunch of green lights. That leads to uncontrolled cell division. That leads to possible cancer. Tumor suppressor genes, as the name implies, suppress the formation of tumors. So if these genes are expressed, no cancer forms, okay? So to reiterate, in healthy cells, non-cancerous cells, in you and I, we have oncogenes that are not expressed, and we, have can and we have tumor suppressor genes that are expressed. The overall impact is to keep cell division regulated and under control and no cancer. However, when a normal cell is impacted by a number of different possible phenomena that can cause oncogenes to be expressed or turned on and or tumor suppressor genes to be turned off. Either scenario, the activation of oncogenes or the suppression of tumor suppressor genes will cause the cell to receive green lights in terms of those checkpoints and uncontrolled cell division will result. And this particular diagram is showing possible triggers of cancer. There are a ton of them, but you maybe have heard of some of these. Um, radiation, exposure to different types of chemicals like benzene or carcinogenic, we often call these chemicals in our environment, can cause cancer. Ultraviolet light coming from the sun, what can that do? 
that can increase the risk of skin cancers, right? So there are a host of possible mutagens, we call them, that could induce mutations within the healthy cells. By that I mean the expression of oncogenes or the suppression of tumor suppressor genes. Either scenario by an environmental insult or just in an inherited condition can suddenly cause cancer to form. And once it starts, it's very, very difficult to stop. Now, we have different ways to try to address cancer. We'll talk more about those in a few minutes. But this is a, a really excellent slide to spend some time looking at. So in essence, cancer occurs when a normal healthy cell undergoes a mutation. And that mutation, in turn, raising green lights at all the checkpoints and uncontrolled cell division results. Not only that, but remember we said the cell loses its special ability to function. Remember, cancer cells are de-differentiated cells. They are not functioning like normal, healthy, non-cancerous cells are. So not only do you lose cell control, division, uh, cell division control, but you also lose specialization. The cells don't function the way, the way they're supposed to. One property of cancer, as we saw in, in the table a few moments ago, was the ability to spread, to metastasize. And we talked about this angiogenesis phenomenon. Remember, the fact that the tumor can form its own blood vessels. And so here we see that process taking place. Here's the tumor, sort of in tan brown. It forms its own capillary beds. It taps into pre-existing blood vessels, arteries and veins. And that, in turn, delivers more blood to the tumor. The blood is carrying the nutrients that the tumor cells need to divide. So one way to try to address uh, cancer is to try to stop these cells from dividing. And we can do that by subjecting the cancer to a variety of chemicals. So we talk about um, somebody undergoing chemotherapy, right? That's typically an IV drip where the individual is provided with chemicals to try to stop those cancer cells from dividing. Maybe that impacts the formation of microtubules in the cancer cells. Maybe that interrupts the formation of the cleavage furrow in the cancer cells. Maybe that prevents um, separation of the chromosomes during anaphase. There's a whole host of different ways that can target, you know, the mitotic stages, different chemicals can do this, to prevent the cancer cells from dividing. Unfortunately, this can also impact healthy cells as well. Uh, radiation, the use of radiation to bombard the tumor with high energy radiation can also kill the cells. Uh, unfortunately, it can also kill healthy cells. So there's always a trade-off often with regard to radiation therapies. Um, and then of course, there's going in and trying to remove the, the tumor too, but you gotta hopefully get all of the tumor and you, you can't see cells and all it takes is a small cancer cell to, to break off and get into the bloodstream. You would never know that by removing the tumor. So it's a very, very difficult um, battle to, to wage, um, but we try, right? And sometimes we win the war, sometimes we don't. I'm gonna shift gears just a little bit here as we wrap up this, this uh, section of chapter three. And this last section talks about stem cells. We could spend an entire course on this and we're gonna just spend about 10 minutes or so. In your body, you have a variety of things that we call adult stem cells. I'm gonna use the example of a, a particular type of stem cell that exists in your red bone marrow called a hematopoietic stem cell. This particular stem cell has a very unique property and that is it can give rise to a number of cell types. It can give rise 
to cells that differ differentiate into a variety of different tissues. Now, one thing that these adult stem cells can do is they can make more copies of themselves. Okay, this so-called self-renewal, this is plain old mitosis giving rise to daughter cells that are of the same type. So adult stem cells giving rise to other stem cells. Okay, so that's pretty simple. This next graphic talks about what can happen when some of these adult stem cells undergo cell division and form a different type of cell called a progenitor cell. So this is sort of a daughter of the adult stem cell that is partially specialized, meaning it's not a true fully fledged stem cell, nor is it a differentiated cell that has a particular function in your body. It's a kind of midway stage. But what's really cool about this progenitor stem cell is that it can divide into a number of different cell types. And that's what's shown down here at the bottom. This progenitor stem cell, which has a name, a myeloid progenitor cell, coming from this hematopoietic stem cell of the bone marrow, can give rise to cells that become either eosinophils, a type of white cell, or neutrophils, another kind of white blood cell, or basophils, another type of white blood cell. There are actually five kinds of, of white cells. This particular myeloid progenitor cell can produce three of those five. So it's somewhat restricted in terms of what particular white cell it can make, but it can make three of the five. A different type of progenitor stem cell can divide into the other two types of white cells, but cannot make these three. So there's a restriction put on this progenitor stem cell. It can't make any old cell. It can make a variety of different kinds, but restricted. Here we've got a scenario whereby we've got two gametes, two sex cells, a sperm and an egg. When a sperm fertilizes an egg, we form a fertilized egg or zygote. Now this particular fertilized egg that undergoes cell division to form a zygote is composed of what we would refer to as embryonic stem cells. And when that embryo forms into a fetus, those would be referred to as fetal stem cells. Now those particular fetal stem cells are totipotent meaning they can form into any possible cell type in your body, it has the capacity or potential to do that. It results from differentiation into a series of additional stem cells, which can undergo self-renewal. That's what these backward arrows are pointing. These stem cells can make more copies of themselves, but eventually they will form progenitor cells of their own which will eventually differentiate into a limited number of cell lines, right? So this particular stem cell came, that came from this totipotent embryonic stem cell can form into cells that result in sebaceous gland cell production or skin cells or neurons. So it has a, a variety of different cell types that it can form into depending upon what what uh, avenue it takes. This particular stem cell that came from, again, the embryonic or fetal cell line will differentiate into its own set of progenitor cells that will eventually form into differentiated cell types. In this particular instance, we could form bone cells, fibroblasts, which we'll talk about later, a primary type of connective tissue cell. And here we've got blood cells and platelets. But note that this particular stem cell that gave rise to these three cell types cannot differentiate and make these three in the same way that this stem cell, when it differentiated and divided into its own set of progenitor cells, can make these, but can't differentiate into these. So that's why we say there is a more limited, restricted 
array of tissues that can form from particular stem cells. But if you trace them all the way back to the embryo and or the fetus, and ultimately back to the fertilized egg, all of these cells here in the fetus or in the embryo have the, the capacity or potential to form all different cell types. And that's why fetal stem cells uh, are so interesting to study, not without their controversy. Um, and we're trying to see if we can take adult stem cells and make, make them totipotent as opposed to pluripotent. So pluripotent means you have a limited series of cell types you can eventually form. You're not totipotent, you're pluripotent. And that's what we just talked about a few moments ago. These particular cells here are pluripotent. They can make a variety of cell types, but they can't make all of them. This fertilized egg and that embryonic set of stem cells or that uh, fetal group of stem cells can undergo uh, a much more diverse array of cell divisions resulting in many, many, many types of cell uh, or tissue types. There is a uh, interesting science to technology box here in chapter three. And I think I may have mentioned earlier in one of the um, uh, Zoom uh, lectures that, and if I didn't, I'll do it now. Um, in, your, in your textbook, you have a number of different uh, interest boxes, these science to technology boxes. And then I think there's another box called clinical applications. I may not have time, often don't, to lecture on those. Yet you should be looking at those because you might see a question on a quiz or a lecture exam. And so this particular uh, science, to, to, science to technology box talks a little bit more about stem cells and the fact that we are trying to take adult stem cells or maybe even stem cells from cord blood and, and cause them in the laboratory to become more totipotent. In other words, make them have the ability to differentiate into whatever desired tissues we want to make. We sort of have to reprogram them and cause them to be less differentiated, make them more pluripotent and even more totipotent so that we can take and, and, and actually encourage them, force them to produce whatever cell line we want. And there's been a lot of research done in the last 20 years on this, trying to take, again, adult stem cells uh, in the laboratory, uh, subject them to different sorts of chemicals and, and voltages and electricity uh, and, and technologies that I can't begin to speak to, to encourage them to lose their pre-programmed abilities and, and reprogram them, give them a new set of instructions so that they can divide into a number of desired tissues. And then let's take those tissues and put those back into the patient. Remember our, our severed spinal cord we talked about earlier. If we could take nerve cells, generate them in the laboratory, and then bring those into the patient at that severed site of the spinal cord, and they could reconnect those damaged ends of the cord. Think about the possibility of that. I mean, it's amazing. Or curing particular types of neural disorders, Parkinson's disease, Alzheimer's disease. If we could determine what's going on in the brain, could we cause um, the regeneration of normal uh, neuronal tissue in the brain or wherever it might be? Um, there's just a, an unlimited source of possible benefits that could occur if we could learn how to do this and then introduce it back into a patient. And actually, we're doing some of that right now. We'll talk more about that later on. Okay, that I think wraps up chapter three. <laughs>